here at New Life Community Church. Um, I said two and a half years ago when uh, we made the transition of, of leadership from Kurt to me, I said, I don't want to do this forever. I want to do like 15 years and then I want to hand this thing off to the best possible leaders that we possibly can. And these two guys are just amazing, godly men, and they're so humble. And I just wanted to thank Matt, because last week we talked about his struggle while he was off canoeing with the, the upside-down priorities that he had, right? <laughs> but the impact that it's had, I've had probably 20 conversations with 20 different people about the impact of his stories and understanding it's not just what I'm thinking, but it's also the way I'm thinking. And if it weren't for the illustration that I could use with Matt, I just don't think that that message would have landed. And so I just wanted all of us to thank Matt for the vulnerability with that. Thank you, Matt. Yeah. Uh, so Ben here is going to talk more about what we talked about last week. So a lot of you have come to me and, and you've had your eyes opened about not just the thoughts that I'm thinking, but also the way I'm thinking and Ben is a wonderful example of what it means to really dive into this stuff, not just helping others, but helping himself and helping me and helping the other leaders here at New Life Community Church. So Ben, just grip it and rip it. Have fun. Okay. Love you. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Lord, let's pray. Um, Father, we just thank you today. We're here to worship you. We love you so much, and so I just thank you for all the people in this room. They're amazing people, and uh, I just pray for them that you'd help every single one of your church at New Life Community to sanctify. Just thank you for the wisdom that's in this room. We ask you to give us more. For the humility that's in this room, we ask you to give us more. For the fruit of the Spirit, character that these people have, give them more. God, we love you so much, and the way we show it is good deeds. It's growing in character and wisdom, and we want to do that this morning. We just thank you for the opportunity to open your word and to take a big bite of it and to, to wrestle with it, to digest it. We're asking to grow. We're asking to love you more, even more than we do now. So we dedicate our day to you. We dedicate our, our Sunday worship to you. We just tell you we love you. In Christ's name, amen. So is anybody here, so we've, we've done the Chronological Bible for seven months. Has anybody like not missed one day? Anybody bold enough to say that? Daniel, why not? Hasn't missed a single day. Or maybe you're the kind of person who will read two days and skip a day, read two days, skip a day. You don't have to raise your hand for that. Maybe if I'm talking about you, just keep that to yourself. But the Chronological Bible, the readings this week, we're finishing up the Psalms, Bye Bye Psalms for the year. We're in the middle of the book of Isaiah. We're reading through things like Micah. And as I said a few minutes ago, we are going to dive headlong into Isaiah 26, verse 3. A little more of that passage, but verse 3, which again says, you will keep in perfect peace all whose eyes are fixed on you because they trust in you. We're going to talk about fear this morning. We're going to talk about how to get rid of fear and how to have the perfect peace of God. But first, let me say this. What we have on our hands, ladies and gentlemen, is a little bit of an unintentional miniseries. You have two bends on a tandem bike. Do you know what to do with that? <laughs> crash it? Okay, we can try that. I'll do my best to crash it right now. Uh, what was I going to say? Yeah, so last week, Pastor Ben taught you from Psalm 119, verse 165, which, if I'm paraphrasing, essentially says this, that if you love the precepts of God, if you love the commandments of God, then you will have an abundant peace. And his primary point was something like, well, the, the more that your patterns of thought conform to God's, and, the, and to the degree that they do, you will have peace. Imagine that. More truth, more peace. And he gave an example. I'm pretty sure this was your example, and you let me know if I'm wrong, but I think there, the example given was of a woman, a wife, and we'll keep her anonymous, but for the sake of story time, we'll just say that her name is Amy Gross. <laughs> so let's just say that Amy Gross has a husband, and maybe we can, we can neither confirm nor deny that her husband is incompetent. <laughs> just saying, I'm, we don't know for sure, but he might be. And maybe her husband is incompetent at fixing cars, which is likely true. So she can think the right thought, right? So it's not enough, as he was saying, it's not enough just to think the wrong thought and turn that into a right thought. You can think the wrong thought, or excuse me, the right thought the wrong way. You can have a weird, bad pattern of thinking. He, he called it a lie factory. And from this lie factory, you can produce all kinds of things. So let's say that her husband, Amy Gross's husband, is incompetent at fixing cars. Well, maybe she feels fear because of that. Maybe what she's saying is, okay, well, if he can't fix cars, then he can't meet my emotional needs. 
He can't, uh, he can't do all kinds of stuff. And my future is insecure and I feel all this fear and I need to control my circumstances and all the rest. And so we're calling that a lie factory. And uh, again, shout out to Matt. Matt, you've blessed a lot of people. If Ben's talked to 20 people this week, I've talked to three. And I know people that have been blessed by what you shared. So it, it takes bravery to be vulnerable, to share with people. I'm thankful for that. So thank you again. And uh, I've talked to three people that have been able to either identify a lie factory, like a new thing that they didn't know was there, or they've gone deeper into their understanding of what that thing was. I've even done some work with that this week. Uh, I've had new awareness of my own patterns of thought. Anybody else? Anybody else feel like, yeah, I've, I figured out my lie factory a little, little bit better? A couple hands are up. That's good. Um, so I'm glad for that. And so the question today is, now that you realize what's going on, you realize you have this thing in your life, well, what do you do with it? Well, the bottom of all these lie factories, the bottom of these bad patterns of thinking, I think almost exclusively is fear. And so we're talking about fear this morning. How can I turn fear into peace? And um, let's talk about that for a minute. So I want to make sure that everyone here knows I am talking to you this morning. We, ladies and gentlemen, have a problem of worry. Worry is a universal problem. Every single one of us have no business being worried about something, but we've probably spent at least a little bit of time this week in fear, in anxiety, and there's all, all types of anxiety. I can't tell you how many people that I've spoken with in the last year who have a weird relationship with God. They don't have the right relationship with God. They don't have peace in that relationship. I've heard people say things like, well, my relationship with God is dry. Uh, it's distant. God's in heaven, and I'm on earth, and there's all this distance between us. I don't feel his presence. He's, he's absent from my life. Or maybe you're the kind of person that would say, well, I just kind of feel like God's mad at me. I don't know if anybody's felt that way. God, God is trying to punish me. God disapproves of me, something like that. And so they're uneasy. People have an uneasiness or a fear in their relationship with God. Well, I'm here to tell you this morning, God wants to give you peace. Maybe you don't have peace with your conscience. Uh, I talked to a man, I think two weeks ago, and he said that his brother was dying. And he wanted to tell his brother on his deathbed that I don't think you know the Lord. And he's scared to do that because he doesn't want to break this relationship on his brother's deathbed. He's, he's afraid to do that. But he knows he can't live with himself if he doesn't. So here's a man whose conscience troubles him. Maybe your conscience troubles you. Maybe you're sitting here and you realize there's something I need to say or there's something I need to do. And I'm not saying it. I'm not doing it. I feel uneasy. Well, God wants to give you peace in that place. It's possible to have a, a fear of, of people. Anybody have a fear of man? You, know, you, you don't have peace in your relationship with others. And, you know, maybe you're the kind of person who knows that somebody you love or somebody in authority disapproves of you. They disapprove of something you've done. Or maybe you even think that they do. And even if you think they do, you're, you're uneasy. You're not well. And God wants to give you peace in that place. How many of us in our lives are trying to grow somehow? You're trying to grow and you're taking one little baby step outside your comfort zone or huge leaps and bounds outside your comfort zone and you feel uneasy. Well, God wants to give you peace. I know, I, I, I think almost certainly, there's people in this room today who said something. Maybe, maybe, you know, open mouth, insert foot, and you said something last week, last month, last year, and you're afraid of this, that it's going to catch up with you somehow. Your past and the words of your past will infect your present and maybe even your future, and something will be revealed about you. It'll be revealed that you're a fake somehow, an imposter somehow. You're alone or worthless somehow because of your own words. Well, in all these ways and more, God is trying to take your fear away. He's trying to fight it. He's trying to chase it away and give you peace. Now, let me ask you this, a little audience participation. You don't have to say it out loud, but something that you've been afraid of either this week or in the past, are you aware of your fear, your temptation to fear? This is a safe place. It's okay to raise your hand, even a little bit, maybe right here. So some hands are up. Good. Okay. Well, God wants to give you peace. If you remember one thing this morning, it's this. This is my primary point. God loves you abundantly. He loves you so much. That is not the right thing. That's fine. <laughs> Ignore that. Hopefully your bulletin is right. Let me see a bulletin real quick. It's right. Pay attention to this. Yeah. God cares for you so abundantly. He wants to chase your fears away. He wants to fight your fears and he wants to give you a God-sized peace. So I hope you realize that. So point number one. Don't be satisfied with the level of peace you have. All kinds of people here feel peace, but maybe it's not God's peace. So as I said earlier, the passage I want to go after is in Isaiah 26. If you have a Bible, you can grab it. You can open it to Isaiah 26. If you have the chronological Bible, what you're looking for is July 17th. That's on page 906. You can read this with me if you'd like. It says, In that day, everyone in the land of Judah will sing this song. 
Our city is strong. We're surrounded by the walls of God's salvation. Open the gates to all who are righteous and allow the faithful to enter. You will keep in perfect peace all who trust in you, all whose thoughts are fixed on you. Trust in the Lord always, for the Lord God is an eternal rock. Thank you. Mm-hmm. So, maybe you've noticed, maybe you've had the experience I've had as you read the book of Isaiah, that this thing is complex. So, I was reading this week, and Isaiah's talking about something historical. He's talking about people and places and things, and all of a sudden, it's like he gets zapped by this laser beam of revelation, and he's off having a vision, and the rest of the chapter or the rest of a passage is talking about the millennium or the day of the Lord or heaven or something of that nature. And so, maybe you've noticed that Isaiah jumps around a lot, and it takes a lot of work to follow him. Sometimes there's a different uh, topic between even just two verses. Sometimes there's thousands of years even between two verses. Maybe you've read this. Maybe you know of Luke chapter 4. Jesus is inaugurating his public teaching ministry in the synagogue in Capernaum. And he opens a scroll, and he's talking about Isaiah 61. And he's saying, ah, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. I'm here to preach the gospel and set the captives free and all the rest. And then he closes the scroll. He said, today it's been fulfilled in your hearing. Well, it's talking about the first coming of Christ. Well, if he would have opened the scroll again and read verse 2, it's talking about the great and terrible day of the Lord, the second coming of Christ. The first coming of Christ happened 2,000 years ago. The second coming hasn't happened yet. So there you go. There's one example. 2,000 years between verses. So the same with our passage. There's different levels of analysis we could apply to it. In Isaiah 26, if you have your Bible open, you can be, be looking at that. There are different ways, I think, different intents that God had for his people when they read this. So this is, this is a song. I don't know if you know that. This is a song. It's a song of gratitude. It's a song of peace. And God wanted his people to sing it when they returned from exile. So there was a future day when they would sing, well, our, our city is strong. Our wall, the walls of God's city are salvation, and the faithful can enter here. And, and certainly there was an intent there. He wanted them to know, yes, Jerusalem's going to be burned with fire. The temple's going to be burned with fire. Off you go into a foreign land. But a future day will come, a near future day, where you'll be able to rejoice and sing this song of gratitude as well as a far future day. God wants his people to rejoice and sing this song of salvation, sing this song of gratitude in the millennium, in heaven, in the future as well. But I don't think that's the only reason he gave us this passage. God wanted his people to rejoice. He wanted them to sing songs of peace and praise and all the rest, not just when times were good, not just when they returned from a hard time, but during a hard time. He wanted them to sing this song about Jerusalem in the land of Babylon, in captivity. And so he wanted that for them. I think he wants that for us as well. So I, I want to ask you this. Do you think it's possible for you to sing a song of gratitude, for you to sing a song of peace in your day of trouble when you feel like you're taken captive by your anxiety? Hopefully you realize, hopefully you want that, that that is possible. That's our topic today. God wants his people to feel incredibly secure and to have peace that comes from salvation. And he wants us to have real peace, not fake peace. Real peace comes from God. Do you know where fake peace comes from? Do you know what fake peace is? There's another word for fake peace. It's called coping. That's just your coping mechanisms. God doesn't want you to have more of that. He wants you to have more of him. He wants you to have more real peace. And so how can we have the peace of God and not fake peace when we're hurting? So in Isaiah 26, verse 1, he's prophesying about the return of exiles And in the day of their return, they'll sing this song. They'll rejoice and sing. Our city is strong. We're surrounded by the walls of God's salvation. And they're giving thanks to him. We don't have to read this this entire passage. We don't have time to. But if we did, you'd see that Isaiah is contrasting two cities. He's contrasting, comparing and contrasting Babylon and Jerusalem. So he's speaking about Babylon. And he's saying, ah, the walls are high. And the walls of the city are so high that they are unassailable. You just can't get into this place. And eventually, one day, this will be brought low by the Lord. It's a strong city because of its pride, and God hates pride. He's saying, one day, I'm going to raise this city to the ground because they're relying on themselves. It's a fake peace. It's a peace, ultimately, that will fail. And then, obviously, in our passage, he's describing Jerusalem, a new Jerusalem. God's people boast that they live in a strong city, but this boasting that they're doing isn't pride. They're boasting in the Lord. They're saying, the walls of this city, your strong city, are salvation, the Lord is their sufficiency, not their selves. Not their, they don't have a self-sufficiency. They have a Christ sufficiency. And so their trust is in a city that has the salvation of God for its walls. My question to you is, what kind of city do you live in? 
What kind of city do you run to when you feel fear? Many of us have peace in our lives, but we do not realize until trouble comes what kind of peace that is. Maybe you recall Matthew 7, where Jesus is teaching something like this. He's saying, ah, if you want to be a wise person, well, I'll tell you what a wise person looks like. It's somebody who listens to my words, and they build their house on a rock. And when you build your house on a rock, and the floods and the winds and the rains come, and they beat against your house, your house is going to stand. Whereas if you're a foolish person, you don't listen to the words of Christ, and you build a house, it's like building a house on sand. And the the rains and the winds and the floods come and beat against your house, and the house falls, and great is the fall of that house. So how can we have a lasting peace? The same peace that's promised in this text. God says, you will keep in perfect peace all whose thoughts are fixed on you. And Isaiah says this in the verse before it. God sets up walls and ramparts for security. It's emphasized twice. And so that's important, obviously. Repetition in scripture is given for emphasis. God is trying to tell us something. He's saying, my salvation has double walls. My salvation is double secure. Rely on me in the day of trouble, and you'll have perfect peace. So I hope it goes without saying this morning. Let me say this to you. That what ultimately protects any of us is not walls or ramparts made of earth and stone. What ultimately protects us is not locks on our doors, it's not money, it's not guns, it's not reputation, it's not personal ability, it's not anything else. What this text says protects us is God's salvation. So the salvation of God is better than any wall, any rampart, any, anything that we could rely on, anything that the world would rely on. We do not rely on anything for our protection except God and his salvation. And so what we have in this salvation is the ability to enter into the protection of God. And this text says that we can feel this reassurance inwardly. It says the thoughts of the person with a steadfast mind are kept in peace by God. So what's awesome to me about this verse, this third verse of Isaiah 26, is that phrase, perfect peace. Perhaps you've encountered that phrase before. Let me tell you what it means. In the Hebrew... That phrase, perfect peace, is the the same word repeated twice. It literally says, shalom, shalom. So not only is salvation double secure, God is setting up walls and ramparts for security, but the peace of God is double peaceful. That's what this text is trying to tell us. We have a double peace because we have a double salvation. And this perfect peace, this is a supernatural feeling of well-being. It is internal and external. As Galatians says, the fruit of the Spirit is peace. God wants you to be happy and healthy and wealthy and prosperous and all of that. But I'm not here to preach a prosperity gospel to you today. Because if all you had was an external peace, and that was taken from you, and you had no internal peace, you wouldn't have much, would you? That wouldn't feel very nice. God wants you to have inward peace. He wants you to have a peace that even if every outward circumstance in your life crumbled around you, the world is falling apart around you, you would have a perfect peace inwardly. Your thoughts would be steadfast and they would be faced towards him. And I think that's the testimony of scripture over and over. Real Christianity is not feeling good. It's not feeling joy and peace when everything's going well in your life. It's just not real, right? Real Christianity is having joy in the midst of suffering, When you can give thanks and feel joy inwardly, instead of worrying, when you're in trouble, you're experiencing the peace of God. And so it says here, God can keep you in perfect inward peace, and he can give it to you in every single way that you need it. This is Paul's prayer for the Thessalonians. He said in 2 Thessalonians 3.16, he said, may the Lord of peace himself continually grant you peace in every circumstance. So where in your life do you need more peace? Where are you settling for less peace than you should have? When you feel anxiety in your life, when I feel it in mine, and we all do, that is a place that you need more peace. Do not be satisfied with the level of peace you have. It is possible to continue to look to God and to be given more. John Calvin, in his commentary on these verses, he said this, those who have their their minds fixed on God alone in the day of trouble will at length be happy. Isaiah said, you'll keep in perfect peace all whose thoughts are fixed on you. And I'm telling you today, my primary point, God cares for you abundantly. He wants to chase your fear and keep you in a God-sized peace. Point number two, we we can have this peace, but how many times do we choose anxiety instead? How many times do we choose our own coping mechanisms? How many times do we choose to control our lives ourselves? Worry is an idolatrous enemy. 
that cannot give peace. We run to it, but it can't actually help us. So would you like the peace of God? Would you like it? Good. Would you like more of it? Would you like it more often? Good. So let's give some thoughts about that. The first thought is this. You cannot have peace when you rely on anything other than God. What this text promises here, to be kept in perfect peace if your eyes are fixed on him, that's conditional. I hope you realize that. God is not promising to give you peace when you're sinning. God is not promising to give you peace and let you keep your idols. It's not going to happen. You cannot find protection from people or money or approval or anything else and have perfect peace. It doesn't happen. He's saying the one I protect is the one who leans on me in times of trouble. And if you do in fact lean on me, oh my goodness, the peace you have will be immeasurable. And so he's saying it's safe to lean on me. It's, it's safe to trust me. I will keep you steady. I will not disappoint you. But if you don't do this, if you allow yourself to doubt God, you will look like the double-minded man that James 1 is talking about, where you're tossed to and fro in your life by the waves of, of doctrine, by the waves of, of, uh, of trouble of all different kinds. You're going to look like the person that Jesus was talking about in Matthew 6. You're the person with two masters. You just can't decide what it is you want, who it is that you will serve. If you rely on your ability to control your circumstances, if you rely on your coping mechanisms to help you when you feel fear, then ultimately that's your treasure, not Christ. So you'll be unstable, and none of us want to be unstable. None of us want to rely on something that is unstable, to be tossed here and there by the waves of life or doctrine or anything else. But this is what we do so many times. I don't know if you realize that. Many times we feel fear. Many times we lack peace. And I get to talk to people every single day about the fear they experience. It's possible to feel fear of all kinds. You can fear the past. You can feel the future. You can feel your fear being out of control. You can fear other people. You can feel all kind, fear all kinds of things. And in every single instance, the person who is in fear does not have a settled mind. They're double-minded. They want so badly to receive peace, but, but they can't. Because what they're relying on cannot produce the peace they desire. Jesus said this in Matthew 6. He said, do not worry about your life. And again, do not worry about tomorrow. Paul said this as well. He said, do not be anxious about anything. Now, it says here three times in three different ways. We are commanded not to worry. Fear or anxiety is sinful. Why? Because it reveals idolatry. It reveals that we are relying on something other than God for our peace, for our security, for our salvation. And we don't think he's enough to provide for us in those moments of need. So if you feel anxious, that's a clue to you. You are not believing the entire truth about God, about his provision for you. Now, let me just say this. I know how harsh that sounds to some people. I know people who chafe under this. People don't want to hear this. Some people are slow to say that worry is a sin. But here's my opinion. This might be the biggest undiagnosed sin in Christianity today. Worry does not sting the conscience of righteous people the way that it should. So why are people slow to say that anxiety is a sin? I think because when people feel anxious, they feel oppressed. To call worry a sin, it feels like kicking somebody when they're down. But the truth is, and I hope you hear this, no amount of worry can help you. It can only hurt you. So let's talk about a way out of this dilemma. Paul said in Philippians 4.19, he said, My God will fully supply everything you need in accord with his glorious riches in Christ Jesus. But man, oh man, do we depart from this? Do you depart from this? Every day it's possible, possible to be worried about something we have no business being worried about. I know many of you could say that's true. So in that moment, when you feel anxious, what you're saying is, I need to do this myself. God won't do it for me. I need to panic. I need to control. But we're being told not to try to fix anxiety ourselves. Ultimately, anxiety is not to be carried. It is not a burden you should carry. It is something to cast at the foot of the cross. So let me read this to you, more in Philippians 4. This is what Paul said. He said, do not be anxious for anything. Instead, in every situation, through prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, tell your requests to God. And the peace of God that surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. So again, do you want the peace of God? I hope you see this. I hope you hear this. It surpasses understanding. 
Let's talk for a minute about human understanding and how to fix anxiety. You feel anxiety usually because you fear loss of some kind, that God will not meet a need, hasn't met a need, won't meet a future need. And when you feel anxiety, you're revealing a part of yourself that believes you must be strong, you must help yourself. And then when you do that, you're leaning on something shaky, something that cannot help you, something you cannot trust or rely on. And guess what? Your anxiety is not solved. It only increases. And so not only can you not rely on yourself in order to feel peace, you cannot think about yourself and feel peace. Do you know that? How many of you feel anxiety and all you can think about is yourself, right? I do that all the time. What will, I, what, will I, uh, what will I wear? What will I eat? What will my future be like? What about my life? I'm worried about me. And so scripture is saying, don't think about you when you feel anxious. Think about God. So there's all kinds of ways to try and fix your feelings. So when you feel anxious, what do you do? Maybe you know in your mind. Again, let's point back to last week's sermon. Pastor Ben was saying, let's figure out what our little lie factories are. What is the bad pattern of thinking that you employ when you're anxious? How does your mind think? Can you study your own anxiety and figure out the pattern? So let me add to that little list of lie factories in a second. So I asked you, where does your mind go when you're anxious? Does it go to God or does it go to yourself somehow? In Isaiah 26, 3, it says that if you have a steadfast mind, God will keep you in perfect peace because the person with a steadfast mind trusts in God. Their thoughts are fixed on God. Now, the Hebrew word for mind in this verse is something called yetzer. The word says yetzer. And in scripture, it means more than your mind. It's your mind. It could be your intentions. It could be your thoughts. The idea here is that the mind produces thoughts. So the anxious mind produces what kind of thoughts? Where do those thoughts run? Do you cast your anxiety on money? Do you cast your anxiety on power? Do you cast it on reputation or ability or something else? It might work for a time. Maybe it's worked for you your whole life up till now but eventually you have to know it runs out. Your coping eventually will fail you. And as much as we would like money or people or God to be God, they're not God. They can't do what God does. Peter says this. He says, cast your anxiety on God for he cares for you. It's the only place to cast it. Only God can keep you in perfect peace. Everything else is fake peace. So let me say a few words about coping with anxiety. We'll add to the list of of lie factories here. When you feel anxiety, do you overthink? There's people out there that are really good at rationalizing, and maybe they're, what they're thinking is, I can think, I can rationalize my way out of feeling fear. It doesn't work. It's possible to placate people. It is possible to just agree with whoever is making you feel anxious. Well, they must be right, and I better just agree with them, and if I could just agree with them well enough and placate them and satisfy them, then maybe my fear will go away. Some go numb. There's people here that go numb and you just cut your fear off. Some people have learned to do that. I cut my emotions off, I don't feel anything. They've learned to just shut down. Some get angry. Now maybe you don't know this, but you can externalize fear as anger. I've seen people who do this and they suffer because when they push out what should come in, they suffer in their relationships, they suffer in their own spirit. Some feel shame. There are people who are afraid of being found out as a fake, as an imposter, as, as worthless, alone, whatever the case may be. And shame is an attempt to relieve anxiety. If I can just feel bad enough, my anxiety will go away. Well, it's just not true. So here's the deal. I bet no matter how good you are at rationalizing, at placating, at going numb, at getting angry, at feeling shame, whatever the case is, I'd bet it doesn't actually satisfy you. And if it does, it's only for a time. It does not work forever. It is not a perfect peace. Philippians, again, says the peace of God surpasses understanding. And Isaiah said perfect peace is found in trusting God. So I know, I know this sounds like Christianese. I know this sounds like a Sunday school answer. But what's the solution to anxiety? It's fixing your eyes on Jesus. And that's something a lot of people miss. So you cannot... Rely on your own understanding and expect to find a place of peace. That's like living in the city of Babylon. That's like relying on yourself to be safe. You're in captivity and you're relying on self. You cannot actually rely on God in that place. When you do that, you're not doing that. Again, the peace of God surpasses understanding. You cannot relieve anxiety on your own. You need faith in God. And here's the deal. 
You can sing a song of gratitude. You can sing a song of peace and of security when you are in captivity to your fear. So would you like the peace of God when you feel anxiety, when you are in the midst of a time of trouble? God is saying that he gives perfect peace to the one with a steadfast mind. How can that mind be described? As thinking excellent and praiseworthy thoughts like Jesus did. A mind that runs to the Father, trusts in him, thinks about him, goes to him. So I know I'm making this sound simple. In a way it is simple, but it's not easy. It takes a lifetime of faith to overcome these things. To choose to trust God rather than trust yourself, rather than engage in worry. But God is happy to help us every time that we falter. Here's the last point I have for you today. Is that the only reason God keeps us in perfect peace is because he cares for us. God loves you so much. I hope you hear that this morning. He cares for you abundantly. It doesn't matter what kind of worry you feel, what kind of fear that you feel. You may feel like it's silly. You may feel like it's insignificant. It's small potatoes. I need to just push it to the side. If it worries you, it worries him. Well, that's a strong statement. But God wants you to, to fight your fear. He wants to help you fight your fear and chase it away. He wants to give you perfect peace, God-sized peace. So I'm telling you to fix your eyes on Jesus this morning. Let me help you do that. Ultimately, we have a thinking problem. We as human beings, we have a thinking problem. And we are told to cast our anxiety on him. He cares for us because too often we don't. We're told to think about what's true, what's noble, what's right, what's pure, what's lovely and admirable. If anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about that. Well, we don't do that very often, do we? Our minds run very naturally to a place of worry. But Jesus said this in the Sermon on the Mount. Can any one of you, by worrying at a single hour to your life, you can't do it. Jesus said that if you're worried about the future, about what you're going to eat and about what you're going to wear, you need to think about it. You need to think about it the right way, not the wrong way. And he said this. This is Matthew 6, 26. He said, look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow. They do not labor or spin. So do you see him saying this? These words, they're underlined. I underlined them for you there. One is look and one is see, and these words are translated otherwise as observe, notice, perceive. He's telling you to think about it. If he cares for sparrows and lilies and everything else abundantly, why not you? So let's take a moment. We'll have some perspective on anxiety. When I encounter dear brothers and sisters, saints like you, I have learned several things that are helpful reminders. I want you to have these reminders today. To start with, let me say this. No matter how much trouble you feel like you're in, no matter how much anxiety you feel, God loves you. God cares for you. So many people think that if they're too needy, that they don't deserve love. But know this, you are not really worse off than you were before you knew Christ. Christ loved you so much so that he died for you when you were his enemy. He had that much care for you then. Will he not have even more now? Or how about this? Many people are in the midst of a trial they have this moment of anxiety, and they completely forget God's past faithfulness to them, right? They completely panic. And uh, as the great Martin Lloyd-Jones once said, faith is a refusal to panic. And so, think of the God that had care for you yesterday. He will certainly be good to you today and tomorrow. So, there's so many Psalms that talk about remembering, and we have a perfect example from this week's reading. So, we're going to double dip into our chronological texts, and read some of Psalm 136. Here's a great example of remembering God's previous faithfulness. So we can do this together. We'll have a little call and response, okay? There's, there's six of these, I think. I'm going to say the first line, and you can say the second, okay? And then we'll remember together. It says this, To him who struck down the firstborn of Egypt. Good. To him who divided the Red Sea asunder. To him who swept Pharaoh and his army into the Red Sea. To him who led his people through the wilderness. To him who struck down great kings. To him who remembered us in our weakness. Amen. 
Mm -hmm. Another way to say this, a verse I've thought a lot about this week, it came up in my study. This is Psalm 103, verse 14. It said, he remembers our frame that we are just dust. That word frame is otherwise translated as mind or thoughts. The same word we have in our text, Isaiah 26, 3. You'll keep their thoughts in perfect peace. Well, he remembers our frame. He knows just how weak our mind is. He knows just how weak our thoughts are, our patterns of thoughts, how we are so predisposed to these lie factories. And so even though we have a thinking problem, and we, we do, God doesn't. We're double-minded, but his mind is set. So if you're experiencing anxiety and you're trouble and you cannot find peace, it's not because he doesn't care for you. It's not that he doesn't want to help you. It's because he is shaking what can be shaken out of your life. He's trying to help you stop relying on yourself and learn to rely on him. Bringing you to a point of desperation and anxiety is an act of care. It doesn't feel like it all the time, but it is. So we can rejoice in this fact that the peace of our church is not founded on how well we can run to him. We don't, we don't really do that that well. It is founded upon his eternal and unchangeable purpose to love us even though we are very weak. So, when we trust in God, he does not disappoint our hope. He is determined to guard us forever. And so, we see the world through a lens of weakness and doubt, but we're being told here in Isaiah 26, verse 4, trust in the Lord always. The Lord God is an eternal rock. So I told you a little bit ago that there's some repetition in our verses. In these four verses, there's something repeated twice, three times. And here's another one. The Lord God, this phrase is rendered as Yah Yahweh, as Jah Jehovah. His name is emphasized. It's said twice. And it's supposed to signify God's power is a double portion. It's exceedingly great. So already in this passage, we have a double wall that protects the city of Jerusalem. We have a double secure salvation. And because of that, we can enter into a double peace. And it's saying here that because we have this peace, it is being offered to us by God, God, by Yah, Yahweh, Jah, Jehovah. His name's repeated twice. Why can you have extra amazing, perfect peace? Because you have an extra amazing, powerful God who's offering it. So this repetition occurs three times as if to say, make no mistake about who he is. So, it stands to reason that if this power of God is perpetual, if his salvation is strong, if his peace is perfect, then so should your faith your faith should be perpetual. You can keep returning to an amazing source of security for help in your time of trouble. In that time of trouble, I'm encouraging you, keep contemplating the nature of God, who he is and what he's done for you. Fix your eyes on Jesus. Yeah, his truth, his justice, his goodness, all that he is, it will never fade. So let me say this. What is perfect peace? What is the peace of God that is really peaceful? A real shalom. It is the promise you can always come to him. And if you come to him and fix your thoughts on him and the intentions of your heart on him and do not lean on your own understanding, he will never disappoint you. He will never forsake you. If you look at the book of Isaiah alone and everything it says about peace, you'd find this. Let me tell you this. It says that he is the prince of peace. It says that his government is one of peace. He keeps us in peace. He establishes peace. He announces peace and brings good news. And it says that the chastening for our peace, chastening for our well-being fell on him. Because of Jesus Christ on the cross, you have peace with God. So yes, maybe you or I, we run to the city of Babylon sometimes. Maybe you're captive to your own worry. But again, you can sing a song of gratitude when you're in captivity. You can be kept in perfect peace. God has another city besides Babylon, one whose walls are salvation, whose gates are open to all who would enter, whose power is not in arrogance, but in humble commitment to God. It is a city that you can live in, but you can live in it only under one circumstance. God's character must be the passion and trust of your entire life. So if you're here and you don't know God in your fear, you experience fear and you're asking, where's God? You can have him today. He's offering himself to you. He's offering to keep you in perfect peace, whatever area of fear you have. But if you're saying, well, I don't, I don't have this God in my entire life, you can have him today. 
And so, if I'm speaking to your heart today and you don't know him yet, you know that you don't know him yet, you are filled with anxiety, you know you are filled with desires to control, you know you are filled with your own coping mechanisms. If I'm speaking to your heart, it's really God. These aren't my words, these are his. He's saying you can be kept in perfect peace. And so, I'm holding out this offer today on his behalf. Today's the day of salvation. And so, the promise again is this. You will keep in perfect peace all whose eyes are fixed on you because they trust in you. And I, again, I remind you, in your day of trouble, you can have this peace if your thoughts and intentions run to him. So go ahead, take a minute, chat with somebody next to you about what was meaningful about this. We'll hear from Matt and the band in a minute, and we'll close.